we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed if ever I choose to marry and the relationship goes sour I shall not be trapped in it. We are hardly blind. We see what marriage has done to our parents. And to others. And we do not like what we see. Last week we said many people are yearning for living examples of people who live in harmony and radiate marital happiness and optimism. And so we ask that how do we as Christians respond to their quest? How do we prove to this lady and to the world that God is not a liar? And that marriage is indeed good. And whoever finds a spouse finds a good thing. Who will stand bail for God? Who is his witness? Who will come in defense of the Almighty? Last week we studied that the primary role of the disciples were to witness. Were to be witnesses of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit power came. That when they receive that power, they will be witnesses of Christ. Defending God and his word by their lifestyle. So one of the legacies of the resurrection of Christ is for us to be witnesses of Christ. The fact that he died and he rose again. And then we study that the witness is someone who has seen an event. A person who has knowledge of an event from observation or experience. And above all, someone who has evidence of the matter. So to be a true witness, you must have seen an event, you should be able to know it, and above all, you should be able to prove it. And now if marriage is good, let us demonstrate it by our marital line. Uh, let us demonstrate it. We said it's not enough to say that God is good. Let people know by your lifestyle that marriage and God is good. So we will look at today's discussion. But let me start by saying this. That the Possessing the Nation's agenda enjoins us to teach our members and to assess their growth and productivity regularly. Now we are not going to measure uh, our church's strength just by statistics that we have so many members, but we need to look at their growth. We need to look at their growth in terms of their productivity. And so our interest in the church is not how many people are married, show me your hands, but let us look at the kind of radiation 
that comes from the Amarita line. Now, members are apprentices, and we need to examine our members' spiritual life, their moral development, as we observe closely how they are responding to the teachings that we are giving them every day and night. Now we are discussing family as an endangered institution. In respect to the possessing the nation's agenda. We are saying that if you want to take the nations, then let us concentrate on the family. Let me make this statement. I mean, we enter? To begin our discussion. It is an understandable fact that marriage was instituted before the outset of Christianity. I hope it is an understandable fact. And I want every Christian to pay attention to this. That marriage is not a Christian ordinance per se. So marriage in and of itself is not a Christian ordinance. Not something that was ordained at the outset of Christianity. When we are talking about Christianity, then we are talking about Christ and his followers. But before Christ, Abraham married, Moses married. So we are saying that Marriage is not a Christian ordinance in and of itself. Now, marriage was ordained for humanity. Genesis 2 from 18. Uh, Genesis 2 from 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. I wonder how he knew. Maybe Adam was a prophet. I don't know. <laughs> that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So when God created Eve, she gave her to the man as the wife. Not a sister. A wife. Right away. Straight away. That was the beginning of this institution. But this time, even the devil had not tempted Adam yet. So marriage is the oldest institution, if you like. And it is deeply in the plans of the Almighty God. And God hallows that one. 
na we e wo nyame adwene mu pa na o nyame de obuo ni ni die sronko e ma aware god wants us to live in this institution o nyame pese ye tena aware mu this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame tanti no bere man be ja ni na eni na ja ho ode ne ho akobata ne re ho na won be nu no aye honam kro na won be nu no na wode da de ja obere man no eni ne re na won ani ewu let's listen to jesus o mi entie jesus in matthew chapter 19 ehwe matthew asempa no eti dun kro I'll start from verse 3. Matthew 19 from verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? A Pharisee for Bani Chain, the son of her say, Obi wa hukwain, a sim biarenti, so jani irana. Having to read, he replied, that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, "For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh." Look at Jesus quoting right from the beginning, from Genesis. Na se na Yesu bua wong mungkin kai se free fiti asiano di obo ni pano oberi mane oba ano yo wong ena oka se yenti no ni pa be jane na. Now you see, so Jesus is quoting from Genesis. In the beginning, it was not so. The creator made them male and female. That is why a man will live and be united to the wife. So we are saying that... Adam married. Cain married. Cain so are. Set married. Set or are. Enoch. Enoch on so are. Noah. Noah are. Unless you don't want to marry. I just say, I won't pass or worry. Otherwise, it is for you. And this idea, I worry over home again. Shall we bad our heads now? I want to pray for those who are not married. And they desire. To marry. Any or power wa what they worry. That God will grant them grace. So nyan kupon be mama dum. Give us thy grace, Lord. I rather my yang adum. My yang wadum. Give us thy grace, O Lord. Thy grace we need. Father and our God, we stand on the basis of the word that your servant has released. And we pray for all those who are in need of marriage. From the north to the south, the east to the west, unto the entire globe, we speak favor upon their lives that you open the heavens. Anything that is covering them and that is preventing them from meeting their partners. May it be broken, O oh Lord. And may you who have sanctioned that it is no good for man to live alone. May your word speak for them. And may doors be opened unto them. And may they also find their suitable partners. We declare it done. Even in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. But let me say that if you don't want to marry... Don't force yourself into it. Some are not just made to marry. And then sometimes circumstances also have not allowed others to marry. 
Don't let any pressure force you into it. But if you are praying and yearning for it, believe the prayer that you are praying. So if you are saying that marriage predates Christianity, then it stands to reason that one does not necessarily need to be a Christian in order to have a successful marriage. All married couples living by the rules of love and understanding can make successful or beautiful partners. However, in the case of Christians, um, our marriages become no ordinary union. It is a sign that speaks to the world. Now of the mystical union of Christ. And the church. And an institution whose first foundation is God himself. Ephesians chapter 5. 31, 32. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So going back to the beginning. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So marriage speaks of the mystical union between Christ and his church. Therefore, for us Christians, our marital life and family lives should not only be successful, but must speak of the goodness of God. Are we together? When two Christians walk to the altar, to be joined in holy matrimony, See, heaven rejoices because their union is strategic. Heaven rejoices. Their union is strategic. And God expects from them godliness and godly offspring. Just like the prophet Malachi wanted backsliding Israel to know. Now, when Israel returned from Ezra to their land, they have lost a lot of steam so far as their worship was concerned. But Malachi wanted to bring them back to the covenant of worship and all that they had to do for God. And I'm saying that when two Christians walk to the altar to join in holy matrimony or when you marry at home and your father or your pastor prays over it, it is marriage. You, you don't need to veil before God who bless that marriage. When two unbelievers even marry, God is interested in the marriage. Because he instituted it before Christianity. So when there is a clerical pastor standing there or no clerical pastor standing there, once it is marriage, God is interested in it. Yeah. Maybe another time I will talk about it. When you don't have money, by God's grace, you perform the customary right. Even by law in our country, it is accepted. Just find a pastor, let them pray. 
and then take your wife home. I say, "Nyami adum uti mi yoba no wa diye wia uti mi akot ni ayenkra ta kama kama sofu obe pompa yego so." Oh, you don't feel much. Maybe we are not teaching well. Maybe it is our fault. Otherwise, when you perform the customary right, it is accepted by law. Find any good pastor. Let them prove it. If you want an ordinance, then see what we can do. The law can permit us in many ways to give you even those certificates. So Ebi, please, when you don't have money, don't wait. Marry as instead of burning. Ebi ana yenchere chere no ene se yeshen ye se obo modi ya koye oba no huwa diye wye na odi no kobe biya wa se se no ma sinsa in kreata ni adi ashu kye sofo na omon pa ye ingo so ma wari ya no no and this is another open up for food. You need and also we be to me. I am on crater now. What worry? Mommy and father, no more be brave. And she's really on side. It's good. I brought food here. I brought food. Mama, I brought. Okay, let's continue. So Malachi chapter two, from verse thirteen. You do for Malachi, how many? Eighteen million. No, any more? Do me answer no. Another thing you do. This is the prophet trying to bring the minds of the Israelites back to God and to true worship. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and will because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accept them with pleasure from your hands. You, you ask why. It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. So I have not seen any record of the Israelites marrying and you needed to wait for the high priest to pray over it. But they were marrying. And once you have married, the Bible said that the Lord is acting as a witness. Israel Yes. Verse 15. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Na enye ba ko na onyankopon eye mo ne hona ene hunhun mu na ade ntira se mo be wo emma nyamso e wo wo mu enti mo hwe mo huyie Now we all need to be careful to marry our spouses well. As I see nyina hwe se ye be ware what I like in verse 15 is this. So guard yourself in your spirit. We need to hallow the marriage relationship. And therefore we need to guard ourselves in our spirit. And do not break faith with the wife or the husband of your youth. The sister says, I hate divorce. Says the Lord God of Israel. I hate it. Now, see, Malachi's contemporaries were distressed because God refused to accept their offerings. As evident by his withheld blessing. And so Malachi the prophet explains that God was acting as a witness against husbands who were unfaithful to their wives. So Malachi now, what does this mean? That the relationship between husband and wife is more than a commitment between two people. Malachi is saying that marriage is a covenant. A three-way relationship in which the couple is accountable to God who acts as a witness. 
e ye nipa basa anase basa fo entem ayonko fa won nyina bu onyankopon anim akonta God who acts as a witness in the covenant. Na unyame and na ujinem se dance for was sapam ye entem. And this is for whosoever enters into the institution of marriage. Na we awa ho ma ubi biara obesen awariem. See covenant in the old testament entails four essential components. Okay. Wo apam da de nimuno e jinaho edima no ma be miensa. Number one, especially in the instance of marriage. It is a relationship. With a non-relative. That involves obligations. And it is established by oath or a sign. So the marital covenant is a relationship with a non-relative that involves obligations and it is established by oath or vows or signs. And then please listen to this. God has the spiritual dimension to the marital life. So say God is the witness to the covenant. If you allow him in into the marriage, he is part of it. He is the witness. When you allow him into it, he will bring transformation to the marriage. The power to transform the marriage is in his hands. Now from what we read in Malachi, we, we also see that spousal fidelity is inextricably linked to spiritual well-being. Now spousal fidelity it's inexplicably linked to spiritual well-being. You watch marriages. Couples that click. You, you see that God prospers them. Marriage must be a good repair. Or else the couple's prayers will be hindered. Wari owe e se to me siesi adie ye pa anya saa onyame shira en to me ma aware for no so. Now, first Peter 3 from 1 to 7. Mo me hwe Peter ho ma edi kan eti me ensa yimu edi kan ko. Now, wives in the same way submit yourself to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. The behavior of their wives. Tara na mo e yirinom. Momre mo huwa se ema mwara muknunom. Na se ebinom entie asem non soa. Wafa e yirinom abrabwa. Asem eni mo huwa so enyawo. Now let's project the verse 2. Momi e fe yi momi e nuno. And shall we read together? Na ye kanya bomi. When they. Now wait, wait. When they what? See. The purity and reverence of your life. The, when the men or women see. Now verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Such as elaborate hairstyle. Man. <laughs> there are some women when you see them outside. Say, hey, this is a beautiful woman. But the husband does not like her. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you see her with elaborate hairstyle and some walks and some beautiful body, but the husband doesn't like that alobo jata. Teacher, only say, "Mum, ma, ma, she said, 'Yeno, enya hunam eni, mani bi owa, oche, seni anafadi etie, seni wanyu ni tiki, kama, 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 ni kunu suru, papa, onpenisa." The husband is not fearing the hairstyle. The husband is fearing what? 
What has been dressed like that? <laughs> that is what the husband fears. Yeah, yeah, man, you could Jata, I say, come come your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewels or fine clothes of course he's not suggesting that go out naked that is not rather instead it should be that of your inner self. That is what the man is actually worried about. The unfading beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. This is the way they used to adorn them. Holy women and holy men used to clothe themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands and let me say to their own wives as well. no. Like Sarah. I mean, I don't think that anybody is that submissive than Sarah. For him, whatever the man will say, yes, Mira. Did he say, Senia, Sarah, Bren, one say, Emma, Nukunu, na Esun Kokraha? I'm not saying that the women, they don't have a say. It is a union. And the two of you, we have to humble ourselves one to the other. It's not only the women who must submit. The men must also submit to good ideas coming from their wives. Very important. Number seven. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. <laughs> Na muni woni se wonso eni mo enkwa wache adumuno ana waye edidi fobi na mumpai boko ensi mumpai boko ensi. Now from Malachi, we also see that though there is a generational blessing, generational blessing is guaranteed if the entire household is brought into the union. That is the man, the wife, God. And if you bring the children and the entire household into it, you are sure of generational blessings. Then you do a lucky tree and not just say, I you away, I want to atwas one shira, see a bomb or say, I do okunu no yere, and if you pump for Nina, a beba worry anymore. Now God expects godliness and godly offsprings from the union of those of us who are born again. You unyan kupon air shifiano, a unyam sumpa, and no fra, what it won't, a unyam sromu. Ah, so we'll be free our room. Our now, room. this is exemplified in the life of one Jonathan Edwards. He lived just for 55 years between 1703 and 1758. We you know, a war, our baby, our Jonathan Edwards, a probably one of the best clergyman that the world has ever known. Because he and the wife Sarah bequeathed godly legacy to 11 children. Eleven children and future descendants. 
It was example teaches us that living a godly legacy to our children should be our ultimate goal as Christian parents. You see, at the turn of the 20th century, one educator and a pastor, A. E. Winship, decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after Edwards had died. This findings are astounding. Jonathan Edwards' legacy includes, I want to list some of them. Now, this is the descendants. We I want to I'll just talk about the social ladder they climb. After 150 years after the man had gone to be with the Lord, one of his descendants have become U.S. Vice President. Three U.S. Senators. Three governors. Three mayors. Thirteen college president like VCs, vice chancellors. Thirteen. Thirty judges. Sixty-five professors. Eighty public office holders. Hundred missionaries. You see, I'm not enthused about the high social ladder they they climb. The way no ma braba wo boy ni abodi ya udwa wo nyaya wo abraba mono eno nyami wawa dodo. I'm saying they climb because and we are just talking of 150 years after he's dead. So by this time. The offsprings are still climbing. And so because of the foundation they stand on. The foundation they stand on. Next week, I will take time for us to look at the foundation Edwards and the wife built for their descendants to stand on. And then we will encourage ourselves to build strong Christian families. We will be possessing the nation. When we start possessing our home. Shall we just rise to our feet if you can? What did the Almighty tell you? Just close your eyes. Then go into the recesses of your heart. If you are married, is your marriage a witness? So of the goodness of God. If not, let us pray God into it. Let's ask God for wisdom to take practical steps to build strong marriages and beautiful families.
to his own glory. He's expecting godliness and godly offsprings from you. So that our children will not be armed robbers. Street children, not at all.